All right, this morning I'm preaching on prayer. I want to encourage you in prayer this morning. You know, we did start a prayer meeting on Tuesday night, so I appreciate Gershon for uh, making that happen. I want to preach on prayer because I want to encourage you guys in prayer this morning uh, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. Prayer requires a lot of faith. And uh, this is why the title of this sermon this morning I got from James chapter 5. Uh, it's called The Prayer of Faith. So if we look here in James chapter 5, it says here, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So what we see in this passage here, the Bible, well, God is telling us how effective prayer is. I mean, not only, you know, if somebody's feeling down, you know, they, they're, they're afflicted, they pray. That can help them. If they're actually physically sick, prayer with the anointing of oil, the elders of the church can help that person. I mean, praying for one another and saying, hey, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It availeth much. Man, if the Bible's telling us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man does a lot, it avails much, why do we not pray more? It's because it's, it's, it's difficult. Why? Because it requires a lot of faith. And we see here now, Elias, you know, and use, use that example of prayer, that he caused it to stop raining for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the earth brought forth his rain. So that's the example of how effective prayer can be and yet it's something that many christians don't do at all or very little at all because we don't really believe what the bible is saying here about prayer i mean we are often guilty of praying like the early church praying for peter now when we went through acts we knew this story we remember peter was thrown in prison for preaching the gospel look what it says here in acts 12 5 peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So Peter's thrown into prison. Now the church, you know, like it says in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. They're praying without ceasing for Peter, who's thrown in prison. So Peter here, when Peter, verse 11, when Peter was come to himself, he said, this is, so this is after Peter's in prison. And the angel, you know, because the church is praying for him, has now escorted him out of the prison, right? Opening all the doors and everything. This is a supernatural prison escape, right? It's just escorted him out, opening up all the locked doors and everything. And he comes out of the prison and then he sort of realizes this is not a vision. This is not a dream that's happening. He's actually escaped out of this prison. Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So remember the church was praying for Peter. So he goes to the house where they are praying, no doubt, for Peter as well. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So she goes in to the group praying for Peter, saying, hey, actually, Peter's out. He's at the door. And look at, look at their response. And they said unto her, thou art mad. Now, what does mad mean in the King James Bible? It doesn't mean angry. It means you're crazy. So you see how, like, she's telling them, hey, our prayers are answered. Peter is at the door, and they're praying for him. What do they say? You're crazy. So you can see that they are praying for something they don't even really believe themselves. And aren't we guilty of that same thing? But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. They then said they, it is his angel. <laughs> but Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Right? So they were shocked that their prayer 
was answered. So prayer is difficult. It requires a lot of faith. You know, we pray for things outside our control. You don't want to be the other extreme either. So in the Christian life, you can be both extremes, right? One extreme is you don't pray at all. And the other extreme is all you do is pray and you don't do anything. So where's that balance? Well, we do things that are within our control. You know, we don't need to pray for, you know, what clothes we're going to put on in the morning. We make that decision. We don't need to pray for, you know, things that we are in our control. But we ought to pray for things that are outside of our control. And we don't want to be like this. You know, pray and not really believe. But it's, like I said, it's not an easy thing to do. Why does prayer require a lot of faith? Because most other things in the Christian life is things that you do. You know, so you have somewhat control over the outcome of that because you can go soul winning. You can read your Bible. You can help other people. So you can do those things and sometimes you can see and you, you have somewhat control over the outcome of that thing that you do, even though you do it through obedience and faith. But when you pray, you are completely asking God to do something that you cannot control. And, and this is why it requires faith. And this is why people don't do it, because they feel helpless, because they don't really believe that God either is listening or is interested or will help them. But, you know, we're going to look at these passages tonight, or today, and be encouraged in prayer. So the Bible says here in James 1, because this is how we, we need to pray. And this is what we want to get to. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But look, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So a bit of a double-edged sword, this verse, isn't it? You know, you want to say, okay, it's telling us how to pray. But it's so difficult to do it. It says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So I think, you know, we need to pray, you know, with faith. But we understand that God is gracious, isn't he? We're not perfect. We don't always pray perfectly. But God is gracious and he answers our prayers even when we lack faith. So it keeps us humble in our prayers. That we don't just go to God just expecting him to do whatever we ask. But we humbly go to God asking, knowing that he hears us, knowing that he wants to hear from us, that he wants to answer our prayers, but trusting that he will do what is right in his perfect time. So I want to talk about four things this morning. First of all, we're going to talk about faithful prayer. Faithful prayer. And how do we increase our faith when it comes to prayer? And I, uh, I'm going to give you some thoughts for some scriptures uh, this morning. So the first one is we're going to go to this story of the possessed son. Mark 9 says here in verse 14, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. <laughs> So every time, I, every time I read that verse, I always think of Ken Hovind's joke, right? Where he says that everyone thinks their child has a dumb spirit. But this is, you know, this is not the dumb as in silly. You know, this is dumb meaning he can't speak. He says, uh, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples, that they should cast him out, and they could not. So this, uh, this is the story of the man with the possessed son. Obviously, he's possessed with a, a devil, and it's affecting him, affecting his health, and it's been for a long time. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. So I don't know if he's particularly rebuking the, the father, but obviously the disciples, he says as well, did not have enough faith either to cast out uh, this devil. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, fell on the ground, and wallowed foaming. So Jesus Christ cast the devil out. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. I think this, these verses here, you know, when you hear from the father, is quite heartbreaking. And oft times it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us, and help us 
So you see here, this is where prayer is required, right? Because the Father, especially with health challenges, I mean, you've done all you can. You try and do everything within your control. And now it's left all up to God. And sometimes you feel helpless, but there is somewhere to go, right? When you get to the bottom and you lose all hope, we can go to God in prayer. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So this is, of, this is often our heart. You know, we want to believe what we're praying for, but it's difficult. So that's one thing we can pray for. It's kind of ironic, you know. How do you pray to help with your unbelief if you don't have the faith to pray for that in the beginning? But, you know, this is where God's grace comes in. And you can see the heart of the Father here, that he struggles to have the faith that Jesus is requiring of him to ask this thing. And he asked Jesus to even help him in his unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. The spirit cried and rent him sore, came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So when the devil came out, they thought the child was dead. But no, he wasn't dead, he was just lying down. And when he was come into the house, look at this, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? He said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So there's two things here. Obviously, there's the struggle of the believer, like we see in the Father. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So that's one thing we can pray for, you know, at the, at the very least. We pray for God to increase our faith, help us to believe the things that we pray for. But the thing, one thing I want to show you here in terms of increasing our faith when we pray, it, increasing our faith in prayer and the fact that we should pray, is he says here in verse 29, just think about this, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So this tells me that in life, in the Christian life, there are some things that can only be accomplished through prayer, you know, and not works. Because they're trying to do the works, they're trying to do, you know, do the right thing. But Jesus says here, no, it, this, this will not happen but by prayer and fasting. So think about that. What things are not getting accomplished because we don't pray for them? Because if there are some things that only get accomplished, through prayer and fasting, and we're not praying and fasting, what things are we missing out on that could be getting done because we're not praying? And if we understand that, this is how we increase our faith in God's Word, because, you know, we, we don't pray. Why? Because in our flesh, internally, we really don't think it's going to make a difference. Because if we did think it made a difference, wouldn't we pray? And, you know, that's what it comes down to. That's what it, you know, why don't we pray? Because we don't really believe it makes a difference. And yet we have so many verses in the Bible. We started at James 5 telling us it does make a difference. And in fact, there are some things that won't happen unless prayer and fasting is done. And yet we still don't do it. I mean, isn't that encouraging us to actually do it? So how do we increase our faith? I want, I want to show you a couple of verses I've been thinking about talk about increasing our faith. Now, first of all, faith is not just a, uh, is it the Wizard of Oz? Just the, there's no place like home, no place like home, just believe, believe in yourself. No, faith in the Christian life is faith in God's Word. That's what faith is. And that's why the world can use the word faith and believe. I don't even know what, sometimes they're talking about believing in, believing in yourself, believing in just, just believing itself. Is just like generic zodiac kind of speak that just like everyone believes. So it just encourages people to just believe in whatever they're believing. That's not faith in the Bible. It's not just a generic belief, the fact that you do believe in something. It's the object of the faith that matters. The Bible says here, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when we increase our faith, we are actually believing more what God's word says. That's why when we increase 
our faith in prayer, one way we increase our faith in prayer is we believe what God's Word says about prayer. Like we talked about this morning, it's effective, it actually makes a difference, and in fact, some things can't actually be accomplished without prayer. Luke 17. The disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith. Maybe we should go to this passage, because I remembered, because when I thought about this point in my sermon, you know, how do we increase our faith? I thought, well, I remember the disciples asked Jesus, let's find out what Jesus says. The apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord said, if ye had faith as the grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now that, that phrase is a lot through the gospel. I'll come back to that, because uh, I want to explain uh, how I think this works, and, and some thoughts on that. So he says first, hey, if, you have your, if your faith is like a mustard seed, you can move, you can move mountains. All right, so we know uh, that's a very popular saying you know, in Christian, Christianity. I want to just explain the second part. So he goes on. And this, this story of the servant, the unprofitable servant, uh, is related to prayer because he says, but. So he continues this thought where they're asking him to increase, his, increase their faith. He says, hey, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can move, you can move uh, this tree, right? And you can move mountains and things like that. But, and then look at this story he gives. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. So I was thinking last night, you know, and I was reading up a bit about it, thinking, how is this related to an increase in faith? Well, what, what is going on in this story here? He's saying, when you have a servant come out from the field and he wants to eat something, and he says, when he's coming, you don't say to the servant, okay, well, you've had a, you know, a hard day, go have something to eat. No, you're going to say to the servant, no, after you've prepared my meal, and I've eaten, then you can eat. And then he says, does he thank the servant for doing the things that were required of him? No, he doesn't, right? And when the servant has done everything that is required of him, it's not that he's done the boss a favor. He says, you've, you've done that which is your duty to do. So you're not even profitable yet, because as a servant, that is what you're expected to do. Now, how I think this is linked in to faith is the attitude at which we, we go to God. So you see here, he's, he's humbling them, right? He's putting the disciples in their place that, you know, through humble obedience to God's word, when you know your place as a servant and you are obeying God's word and you haven't done anything great by obeying God's word because it's just you're an unprofitable servant, that's through that is how your faith increases. Because why? Because you're obeying God's word. Just like faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, you are doing God's word. And if you're humble in doing God's word, your faith grows in God's word through the doing of God's word. This is what I think he's trying to teach you. Not only the attitude, but through the obedience. And this is also, I think, how he's answering the question of how to increase the faith. See, it's not just that they thought, hey, they want Jesus to increase their faith, that Jesus can just, you know, zap and just give you an increased faith. But I think what is being taught here in Luke 17 is if you want your faith to increase, it actually is done through obedience. As you obey God's word, your faith must grow through that work, as opposed to just all of a sudden getting a double portion of faith, if that makes sense. So this is why when you think about increasing my faith, is my faith, just, do I just ask God, increase my faith? Or do we have to 
be obedient to God's word, and the more we obey God's word and we humble ourselves in God's word, that our faith grows. And this is why I think it's linked to the mustard seed. Because I often heard it said that even if you have faith as a mustard seed, and then, you know, they say it's not the size of your faith, it's where you put it. You know, and then it's able to move mountains and things like that. But I don't think that that's what is actually being taught. So there's a few thoughts. That's the thought I've always heard, which is, you know, if you have a little faith, you know, you try and encourage people that have, like, very little faith, say, well, even if you, you know, have it in the right person or whatever, you can move mountains, right? Now, with salvation, obviously that's true. Put our faith on Jesus Christ, hey, the impossible is possible. As we grow in our faith in the Christian life, I don't think that's the analogy of the mustard seed because when Jesus explains the mustard seed in Mark 4, it says here, he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So you see the analogy of the mustard seed is yes, it starts small, but even though it's the smallest of all seeds, it grows and it, can, it has the potential, right, to grow into this huge tree that not only, you know, can support others and bring shade to others, it helps others. That's what I think the analogy of faith is, is that when it's saying you can do great things, it's not in the state of the mustard seed, it's just that the mustard seed has potential. And through obedience, right, and as we walk in God's word and our faith, our faith can grow to the point where we accomplish great things. But I don't think somebody accomplishes great things with a mustard seed faith in the sense it stays a mustard seed. I think they accomplish great things that has that, it has the potential, if that makes sense. Even that, that mustard seed faith has the potential to grow into that great tree but how do we release that potential? Well, that's why I think Jesus is teaching them. Well, it's through works and walking in faith in God's Word. So faithful prayer. Let's go on to the second uh, point I have here. The model prayer. The model prayer. So the model prayer, that's what I think it should be called. Um, a lot of people call it the Lord's Prayer. But, you know, I don't think it's right to be called that way because Jesus is not actually praying in uh, Matthew 6 and in other places where he goes over what's known as the Lord's Prayer. It should be known as the model prayer because it's a guide as to how to pray. But where do we see the Lord's Prayer? We'll go to that later on in this point. The Lord's Prayer we see in John 17. John 17 is when Jesus actually prays to God. And you can now actually see how the Lord Jesus Christ prays, as opposed to just giving a guideline of, hey, this is what some things you could pray for. Matthew 6. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So before he goes into the model prayer, he talks about the right attitude we should have towards prayer and it's not a show right it is something that should be earnestly you know we are seeking god but thou when thou prayest enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut thy door pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly so you know in the king james bible this old english here thy closet you know a lot of people think oh you know they take this in today's uh, use of the word closet, and they think they have a prayer closet. So God is not expecting you to go into your wardrobe and pray, you know, go into this little room, which some people do, because in the, the older English, closet was just like a private room. So he's just saying, you know, you go into a private area to pray. It's not necessarily saying you have to go into this, this small enclosed closet with your clothes and everything like that, which is what a lot of people do, but they're just taking this word with the, the current meaning as opposed to what it meant you know, in 1611. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. 
And this is the irony of this passage that Jesus is saying, you know, before he goes over the model prayer, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And then what do the Orthodox and the Catholics and some Protestants do? They take this passage and then they just turn it into a vain repetition prayer where it's just words that they just repeat. And it's just something that they say they're praying, but they're just repeating words. So where Jesus has said, don't use vain repetitions because it's not the amount of words or the amount of times that you say it, you know, the number of Hail Marys and all this, turn it into your Hail Mary and rosary beads. No, he's giving us a model prayer to say, hey, when we pray to God, these are the sort of things we should pray for. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Now this is an interesting verse because what he's saying here is one thing is, you're not trying to get God to, you know, uh, you know, you're not letting God know something that he doesn't already know. So then when you think, well, when I pray, I'm not informing God of what my prayer is. So then what am I doing? And I think the, the idea of prayer and by extension, prayer and fasting, is you are actually showing God the earnestness of your prayer. You know, how bad do you actually want it to actually pray? That's what God is looking for. Um, because he's not looking for the content, right? That's for yourself, right? You remind yourself what you need to pray for. That's why we have prayer lists. But when we pray, it's not like we're letting God know something he doesn't already know. We are actually showing the earnestness of our prayer by asking. Because he says here, your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. So the way I've sort of sectioned off the model prayer is, you know, the first part is you're kind of praising God, you know, glorifying God in heaven, wanting his will be done on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So this next two verses is God providing for us, physically, but also spiritually not only salvation, but also the daily food of, of his word. And then the last one is protection. So you can remember the three Ps. You know, he, we praise God, we ask for him to provide for us, and prote protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So that's protecting us from ourselves, temptation, but we're also protecting us from outside as well. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So that we should call the model prayer. You know, I know it's known as the Lord's Prayer, but I, I think it's better to refer to the Lord's Prayer as John 17, because this is where we actually see how Jesus prays. And we see the same kind of, when he went over the model prayer, we see the praise, you know, the providing and the protection, and we even see that in John 17 as well. So John 17, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So you see how he's praising God? As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So you didn't see in John 17, like him kneel down and go, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You can see he is actually praying to God. And as it's a heartfelt prayer, you know, praising God from here from verse 1 to 5. Look at verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Doesn't that remind you of, give us this day our daily bread? He's saying, hey, I gave them this day their daily bread. <laughs> I've given them the word that thou gavest me. And then protection. He's praying even for the protection of his disciples. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. See that? Deliver us, you know, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I think it's interesting. Like I said in Matthew 6, verse 8, God knows. So why are we praying? 
Do you really want what you're praying for? I've used this illustration before. Children, sometimes they'll ask a question or they ask for something, you know, but they don't get your attention right there and then. You say, look, I'm busy or come back, you know, I'll ask, you know, ask me a bit later, but then they don't come back. So what does that tell you as a parent? As a parent, that tells you well, whatever they're asking for must not have been that important. You know, whatever question they had must not have been that important. Or they may not have really wanted what they were asking for because it was just a passing thought for them. A passing thought, that's what kids do, right? They come in, there's a passing thought, and there's zooms in one ear, out the other. We can be like that too, where we are not really desiring what we are after. That's why we ask once and then we forget about it because we don't really want what we're praying for. So we want to have third section, third section, persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. Let's look at two parables. And this kind of gives you the idea of how God wants us to pray. Luke 18. He spake a parable unto, him, unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. So this is the parable of the unjust judge. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. So the widow is coming to the unjust judge, saying, I want justice. And he would not for a while. Why? For a temporary period. But afterward, he, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because of this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Think of, think of this um, oh, my nose is running me. Think of this parable. Isn't it interesting that God uses a parable of literally a widow getting her way with an unjust judge, not because it was the right thing to do or through any threat, just annoying him to the point where he's just like, I just want to get rid of her, right? And, you know, he's using this parable because he's saying that's how persistent we should be. God's not going to be like the unjust judge, right? He's not going to get annoyed with us like this judge is, but he's trying to explain to us this is the type of persistence. This is how much the widow wanted it that she was willing to continue to weary this judge until the judge gave her what she wanted. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, look at this, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find what? Faith on the earth. So you see how the persistence of your prayer shows how much faith you have. Luke 11, here's the other one. And this is actually taught alongside the model prayer in Luke 11. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he, so, so that's interesting as well that John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. You'd think that he's just in the wilderness, just people just see him as like, you know, camel's hair and goat, goat skin, eating locusts and just preaching hard, right? But no, he actually discipled the disciples as well before Jesus came along. He taught them how to pray. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, so the, the words are slightly different here in Luke 11, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, so he's, remember, he's teaching them to pray. So one is the model prayer. He says, these are some things you should pray for. And then he gives another, uh, another uh, parable, but this time slightly different. So that, the other one was the unjust judge and the widow. He said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, Lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his, is, in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. Like, leave, leave me alone. Don't bug me. The door is now shut. He's saying, hey, it's late. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, 
because he is his friend. Isn't that, isn't that a sad thing? It's what such a good friend this guy is, right? It's the, he's saying here, he doesn't want to rise because he's his friend. But it should be the other way around, right? That, you know, if somebody's your friend, that's when you're willing to go out of your way. But often, familiarity breeds contempt, right? I don't know if you've ever heard that saying. Familiarity breeds contempt, misery loves company. Um, he is, yeah, he's his friend. Say, so because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, right, his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, a lot of lessons there in Luke 11. But we see there the model prayer we already talked about. We see there the same persistence that he's teaching when he taught the parable of the unjust judge where he's, he's giving us the idea of how we ought to pray to show the earnestness of our pray to the point of, you know, in an er, in a, in a, in a earthly sort of fashion to other people. It would be like nagging them. But he's saying, no, he's not being nagged. This is how he wants us to show our earnestness. And he's saying, hey, when he finishes off, do we, does God respond with bad things? No, because if Father loves their child, God loves us. He will answer our prayers in his time. So this is what he means. This is what the Bible means when the Bible says pray without ceasing. You keep asking God for the things that you desire. But the last one we've got to talk about is are the things that you desire according to God's will? So this is the last caveat, right? So number four, godly prayer. Godly prayer. Because when we read these passages like we just saw, you know, I mean, ask and you receive, seek, seek and you shall not, I think a lot of Christians get the wrong idea that if they're just persistent in ungodly prayers, that they'll get what they want. But that's not the case. You know, so we have to pray according to God's will. So you may read verses like, so Matthew 7 is similar to the one we just read in Luke. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Again here, John 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And it kind of makes me think that it's related to that unprofitable servant, where the unprofitable servant, you know, is just humbly doing his Lord's will and realizes that he's not doing his Lord any favor, he's just obeying God. So as we obey God, we increase in faith, we also increase in our knowledge of what God desires and what His will is, so our prayers become more godly rather than more worldly, just asking for things for ourselves. Matthew 21, And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Man, I'm sure the prosperity gospel preachers, they love these verses, right? Just name it and claim it. You know, but don't you have... Don't you have this mindset that you just name it and claim it? You just, if you just pray for the things that you desire, God's going to give them to you? No. Because what does James say? Look at what James 4 says. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, and look at this, ye receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So a lot of people pray for things, and if you were 
you know, look down into your conscience, you know, into right into really, why do you think, why am I really asking for this? You know, am I asking for this to, sat- to serve me? You know, maybe that's why your prayer is not being answered, because you are asking amiss. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. Look at this, that ye may consume it upon your lust. You are asking for something to fulfill your own selfish desire, to fulfill your own purposes, to serve you. Is that the purpose of prayer? No. And maybe that's why our prayers are not being answered, because we don't earnestly seek God's will, God's desires, and what God wants. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So how are we going to find out what God wants? Well, we have to read God's word. God's will is revealed in God's word, and that's why we increase our faith, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more we do God's word, the more we grow our faith in God's word. And that's why when you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, right? It's going to grow because it has the potential. Not that your faith, as small, right, does great things. Faith that grows does great things. So I hope you're encouraged to pray. You know, we, don't, we, we often don't pray as we ought, but hopefully a sermon like this helps to increase your faith in prayer. So number one, we want to have faithful prayer, grow your faith through humble obedience. Then we have the model prayer, give us some ideas of what to pray for. Praise God. Ask God to provide for us physically, spiritually, protect us from our own temptations and from the evil out there. Number three, persistent prayer. Keep praying. You know, don't quit. Do you really want it? Do you really want what you are praying for? And number four, we want our prayers to be godly prayers. Pray according to God's will, not your will. All right, let's pray. Lord, help us to pray. And Lord, help us to increase our faith through obedience to your word. Pray that we would grow our faith if it's now a mustard seed, that it would grow into that great tree that birds can lodge in and it provides shade for others. Grow each and every person's faith in our church. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're a God that hears our prayers, that wants to know our prayers. And Lord, we trust that you will answer our prayers in your perfect time. So we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.